Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Our guest today is the city manager for the city of Roanoke, Bob Cowell. We'll talk about getting past the pandemic with the help of federal funding, supporting local businesses, and what Mr. Cowell likes to call shared equity, and how that's a good thing for everybody. And Bob, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Gene. Happy to be here. Yeah. Let's, uh, before we get going here on some of that stuff, I just wanted to talk real quickly, because this is something you've gotten before, as we go to taping, the, the Center for Digital Government uh, uh, announced that Roanoke was another winner of the 2021 Digital C City Survey, recognizing how the city uses technology to interface right. with, with um, you know, residents. I know that's a big thing for you. Just talk about that, making it easier for people to access services and all sure. that. Sure. So, um, you know, we try to go beyond just having the, the usual. So the opportunity to look up stuff on the website, which we have, um, and our social media and those um, types of activities. And of course, with everybody shifting to Zoom, we've had even more of those opportunities to engage the, uh, the community more directly with technology, whether that's being able to access information um, so they don't have to come down to uh, the municipal building to gain that uh, information. Mm -hmm through our website, um, or if it's actually participating in focus group meetings um, sure. via Zoom. So it's been, an, it's been an important part for us to kind of expand um, those offerings and really allow the, uh, the citizens to take more control over how they actually interact with their, their local government. Do you see the Zoom portion, because uh, several different committees, Gun Violence Committee and the uh, Equity Empowerment Advisory Board, so on and so forth, the, the group that you know looked at how to divvy up those funds from the federal government. Do you see that as a component that will stay in some, some respect in the future? I, I do. It's, it's been a bit of a challenge in Virginia because those official bodies have to meet in person. Um, we were able to do those meetings via Zoom under the emergency order, but once that ended, okay. now they have to meet in, in person. But what we have found are things like task force or focus group meetings. They actually work sometimes better on Zoom. We get a lot more participation. Um, folks show up on time, th those, those kinds of things. That, so I do think that'll become kind of a permanent part of, mm -hmm. um, of our way in which we interact with the citizens. So how long have you been in your position now? Just a little over four years. Okay. So I'm closing in on my fifth year. Okay, you came from San Antonio, correct? No, no, from Amarillo, Texas. Am Amarillo, yep, Texas, yep, somewhere yep, out there. Yep, yep. Um, and I know it's always been a big thing with you, Bob, as far as, uh, seems like it's been a big thing as far as being transparent to the public. You've written blogs online and all that. Uh, was that just something you learned in your during your career that it's that's the best way to go yeah I mean I, I try to be as transparent and as forthright with folks as I can sometimes that means sharing bad news with them mm -hmm. um, but I'd rather do that than actually be surprised or have them be surprised as we go through so I not only have tried that with the general public either in um, forums or the blog that I write each week or and, and certainly with the council as well so in addition to the things you see on TV with the council you know every Every week, they're getting an update from me so that they all have the same access to information. I meet with them individually on a monthly basis. It's just important because, you know, the goal is to try to do the right thing um, as we work our way through. And the best way to do that is just be upfront with everyone and um, good, bad, or um, uh, ugly. Um, mm -hmm. We got to share those things and actually figure out a way forward. Right. Well, at least if you're transparent with people all the time, you're not springing bad news on them. They, 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 they know. Right. He's, you know. It's one of the things he has to do. Yep. I wanted to talk about some money. Let's talk about the $64.5 million that over the next couple of years that Roanoke will be giving up. That's American Rescue Plan money. Right. You put a, a, an advisory panel together to talk about uh, uh, of residents mainly of how to sp spend that money. One of the mandates was that it had to make an impact, mm -hmm. that money. Talk about that whole process what you came up with and maybe what you learned even about uh, how much citizens are wired into the Sure, yeah, the we, we actually replicated kind of the process that we used with CARES Act um, funds. In that instance, all of the what we did with the CARES Act was virtual. Um, in this case, we did it kind of a blend between virtual and in person. Um, so we started with focus group meetings that each of the council members led. Um, one, uh, one council, or one uh, focus group meeting per council member, probably about 10 or 12 people in each of those. And they centered around topics like housing and transportation, those kinds of things. 
Then we um, progress to stakeholder interviews and then a uh, community survey. And then as you mentioned, the advisory panel that was formed by the council made up of representatives from a cross section of the community. I think there were 36 in total um, on, that, um, on that panel. And the mayor and vice mayor actually facilitated those meetings and they met maybe five, six times. Um, and they did that in, in person um, and in public. And we had members of the public attend. And as they neared their um, kind of draft recommendations, they held a public hearing, which we had something like 70 folks actually come and speak at um, as well. So really um, robust engagement as we went through. And, um, and all of that resulted in recommendations that were delivered to the council who adopted them um, in total, just like they did in the CARES Act. And it covers the full gamut of things of um, what we broke into was recovery and resiliency um, projects. Recovery were those immediate kind of impact um, initiatives. And the resiliency, as you said, were more of the long-term kind of impact. They really, council really wants to use this money not just to plug gaps um, that are immediate, but also to do something that makes the individuals, the households, and our community stronger in the long term. Um, one of the benefits we've had here in Roanoke is um, our, our local budget actually has done fairly well during the pandemic, um, a bit to our surprise. As far as tax um, revenue? As far as like tax revenue, yeah, it's a lot more resilient than really we had feared it might be going in. That's allowing us to use all of the American Rescue Act funds in the community. Um, other communities have had to use large um, segments or large portions of those funds just to balance their budget, and, and we've not had to do that. So that's given us that advantage to make sure that whole $64.5 mm -hmm. million is working out in the community. Well, that's a good deal. It's almost like a matching grant or something. Yeah, absolutely, and in this case, no match. I mean, right. It really, right. You know, we, um, we actually can claim, if you use the formula, we could claim some of those funds just to balance but we just don't need it, so we're able to actually put it all back out um, into the community. Uh, you know, Bob, how early, how crucial, I should say, were those early COVID relief packages going back to 2020 and helping local businesses, you know, keep people on the, the payroll and the doors open in Roanoke? Yeah, I mean, we've heard kind of the, you know, always hear sort of stories coming out of it. And I'd say the things that made the most impact with were um, individuals that were confronted with things that were, you know, kind of one-off. They, they fell behind in a bill and those dollars helped keep them in their home um, or help pay a utility bill that they would not have otherwise. And on the business side, certainly it kept people employed um, between our help as well as the federal programs around payroll protection, kept folks employed that they might not otherwise have been able to keep employed. Um, one of the more interesting projects we did was one where we provided funds to the, um, the restaurants in the community who were really suffering during um, mm -hmm. the, the real height of the pandemic. For the purpose, though, of hiring live entertainment that they would bring into the um, into their restaurant or into their uh, their bar, the idea being we actually got more people to come to that restaurant or bar than they might have otherwise, um, which of course helped them. And they were employing a, an entertainer, if you can imagine, who were not um, playing. There was no place for them to play, and that was actually both one of the least expensive um, outreach efforts we did and one of the more successful ones as well. Well, that's interesting. Were you involved with the, when uh, Lucky had a couple of people show yeah, up? Yeah, those were, those, those were um, some okay. of the things that we did. And that came directly out of the interaction with the community. That, that's not something I'm confident that the staff <laughs> would ever have come up with on right. their own. It was through that process that it actually um, floated up to the top and relatively inexpensive program and really yield it for that period of time really sure really you spend 500 bucks or something and yeah. they get a bunch of people in the door to eat at yeah. lucky yeah and that entertainer gets an opportunity to get paid for a gig they might not otherwise have done sure you know when you look at the business community especially downtown bob how did uh rono come through the pandemic let's let's focus on downtown were there a lot more closures than normal was it sort of you know, in line with what had been before that? Or yeah, I, there were less than we had expected. Um, I would say closer to normal. Um, you know, in our interaction with the uh, the downtown businesses, it's been a mixed bag. Um, I'll use Orvis as an example. Or Orvis has definitely had seen and still is seeing a significant drop off of folks that come into their stores. Mm -hmm. um, and yet their overall sales out of that store have gone up. So what they're seeing is fewer people going into the store, but when they go in, they're not just there to browse, they're there to buy, uh, okay. which has been interesting. And of course, all of them, whether it's chocolate paper, whether it's Orvis, wh whoever it might be in downtown, they're all experiencing significantly higher online um, sales than, than they've ever seen. So, so it's been odd, um, not, um, you know, not the kind of business they would have seen before, but still relatively strong right. um, business as they, move, as they move forward. You know, hospitality has certainly struggled more than the retail piece, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's, it's better than we would have thought that it could right. have been. I know a lot of small businesses, I've talked to people that they never had much of an online presence or a retail shop, and they just had to 
get with the program if they wanted to stay in business to some extent. Yeah, absolutely. And same with like curbside pickup. I mean, folks that had never even dreamed that they would be um, offering a product that somebody would actually come and pull up in front of the, the store and actually pick up. And so they had to kind of um, change to create an online presence. They had to think about packaging, all of those kinds of things. How do you, you know, how do you sell someone a 40 or $50 meal that they're going to pick up in a you know, styrofoam container and take home and still have the same kind of enjoyment with it sure. as they would have in the restaurant. It was all new territory for them. And I know some of them used some of the federal funds and our funds to kind of help make that transition. As a matter of fact, we have coming up uh, another program using the ARPA funds, which is for that purpose as well, that for those businesses still looking to pivot, there'll be grant dollars made available to help them in that, in that effort. And right. that was one of, the, one of the recovery efforts that came out of the, uh, the recommendations from the panel. A lot of businesses were really resilient. I've talked to like Cat Pascal at Farm yeah. Gesa. They had to get into the whole curbside thing and uh, delivery. They turned their workers into delivery people, that yeah. type of thing. Uh, you know, did it, it must have made you feel good even over the past year, Bob, um, that businesses would hang out a shingle and open up. Yeah, they absolutely. had enough faith and things were covering. Yeah, that's been really one of the even more shocking things is not only have, thankfully, we've seen businesses continue to succeed, but when you see new businesses opening up in the midst of the pandemic, they have certainly um, a, a great more vision than I, uh, I possess as well. So I'm really happy that they're able to do that and we want to support them in, in any way that we possibly can. And, and it really does show the vibrancy and the resiliency of our local economy. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I got to Roanoke about 25 years ago. The downtown district seems to be thriving. There's several thousand people living down there now. There's all sorts of nightlife and eateries, much different than um, 15 to 20 years ago. Yeah. Is that an attraction for people maybe considering moving here? It, it is. If they um, like that urban, you know, lifestyle. Absolutely. It's one of the few places you can get that um, in this part of the world. And, um, and it is definitely something that if you're, uh, I'll use, uh, for example, the folks at Fralin Biomedical Research Institute. I know when they're actually recruiting researchers to come into um, and joining the organization, um, one of the things they highlight, obviously, is downtown and the vibrancy of downtown, mm -hmm. along, of course, with our mountains and rivers and, and sure. trails. And those combined really offer something you don't find in many other places and certainly play a significant role in our, um, our economic success. Well, at least in Roanoke, if you like the downtown urban living, you can be out of it in 10 minutes. Yeah. You can be you know, in the Appalachian Trail or on 81 or something or... Yeah, we always, we always like to joke and say, you know, you can, it's one of the few places that you can be working at a bench in your lab and you can literally grab your, you know, your kayak or your stand-up paddle board and, and walk out the door Seriously? into that water feature. And if you don't like that, then you can get in your car and drive 10 minutes later and you're up on a trail in the mountain. Mm -hmm. um, there's not many places like that. Let's, you know, since you brought up the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute, I want to talk about job creation. You know, do you, down the road, do you see the Fralin Biomedical Research Institute becoming a, a bigger job creator in the area, or you know, or even in some of the startups coming out of the ramp, high tech business startup. Right. Is there a potential at the FBRI? Let's start with for for the type of job creation that could bring, you know, a couple thousand people here with their families and all that. Yeah, a absolutely. I think. You know, the, the Institute is really there um, kind of in our minds for really kind of three purposes. One of them is obviously to, to educate researchers um, and, and others in the medical and biomedical um, profession. The, the other is to make, um, as Mike Friedlander likes to say, you know, world-class innovation and change in healthcare. Um, you know, make a difference in people's lives across the entire world. And then the third is for us locally is to generate that kind of econ economic activity like you have mentioned. And we've seen some of those, certainly some of the... Um, Companies that are in the cohorts at the uh, the ramp, um, of course, are coming out of um, out of the research institute. But really, um, the next stage of that is actually that next kind of level, really scaling up, and that really involves something like a shared lab kind of facility. Right, that, and, uh, Mike Freeland talked yeah. to us recently about a, creating a wet lab offsite. Ex exactly, and that'll be the next piece because. What we're seeing right now is one or two researchers, they get an idea, they get together, um, they may nurture that at ramp, they come out, they get um, a patent or uh, and a product, and, and they're generating some economic activity, but it probably is one or two individuals. Mm -hmm. the, the shared wet lab kind of thing w is what will allow it to expand into those kinds of opportunities that have ultimately employ hundreds of folks. And that is ultimately the long-term game changer that the Institute represents. Right. You know, uh it, it, it's always a big thing, it's, you know, attracting and retaining people to, for Roanoke and, and things like that. If, if you have that type of job creation engine, could it keep more people here, more it, young people here? Yeah, I mean, we really, really hope, and I know there's been several folks working on this at the regional partnership as well as Verge. Aaron Bircham certainly has been sure. instrumental in this, of making the connections of students that are at Virginia Tech or at the, uh, the medical school here 
just to make certain that they understand just how special this area is and the opportunities that exist. All of that, though, is, of course, dependent on there being a job. Um, right. So the more jobs we're able to create here, the greater the chance we have of keeping them here um, so they don't go on um, up to the D.C. area or other parts of um, Virginia or the, or the country yeah. as well. Or they may come back. We just talked to Taylor Johnson. You know, she yep. was hired by the regional partnership. She was up in Arlington or Nova for 10 years. And during the, COVID, the pandemic, she had to come back here. And she decided, you know what? I, I think I'm going to come back here. Yeah. So she's yeah. like a boomerang person. Yeah, we've definitely uh, benefited from that in our office as well. Some hires that have come back um, after having been in D.C. or somewhere. Sure. And they realize the quality of life that exists here and um, just know that this is where they want to be. All right. I want to talk about something else. So this is a big thing with you. Uh, talk about interwoven equity. It's something that you've been uh, working with the city of the Bacon to the updated comprehensive plan. Talk about what that that's all about, Bob, and how it and how equity relates to the local business world and economic sure, health. Sure, sure, yeah. So our uh, comprehensive plan was updated a, a year or so ago, and it had two overarching components to it, which were, were new. Uh, one of those was health for all. So it was a real focus on health outcomes in our community. And the other was the interwoven equity. And what that really is focused on is ensuring that folks in our community um, do not have, I'm going to say, artificial barriers. Um, in many cases, they're barriers that were put up um, in front of them, but artificial barriers to realizing to their fullest extent the success that they could have in our community. And it's a direct relationship, actually, what we just talked about with the uh, Biomedical Research Institute in that a lot of those jobs are being created, and it's great that we can retain college students or attract folks into the community. We also have a very um, large workforce here that if trained and if those barriers are removed, could plug into those, into those jobs as well. So the interwoven equity is really about that. It's really about um, taking what is the diversity in our community and really recognizing that it's a strength to our success and trying to nurture that and remove those barriers so folks have that opportunity mm -hmm. to succeed. Um, one of the first actions the council took with that was the adoption or the creation of the, um, the Equity and Empowerment Advisory Board. Sure. Um, and that's got a couple council members on it that leads. And they're looking for areas inside our city where either programs, procedures, policies that we might have um, might either further some kind of inequity um, or limit some um, way in which folks could be further empowered. And, um, and that's one effort. Um, inside our organization, we're actually looking at every program we provide um, in our budget, for example, and evaluating against those same things to say, are we delivering street paving, for example, um, in an equitable fashion? Mm -hmm. um, are we certain that the uh, street light program we have is um, adequate in some areas and not in other areas. So we're asking all of those questions just so that, as the saying is often said, you know, that someone's um, determination of success or not isn't determined by the zip code that they, that they live in. I'm wondering if when you were going through that process, even paving or lights, whatever, that maybe if you found some systemic or built-in inequity that people don't even know why it's there anymore. Yeah, I mean, a really good example of this one is one we went through with sidewalks. Um, so. We ran a, um, an exercise to try to look at our work orders for um, either new or sidewalk repairs. And, uh, and what we found was, unlike our street paving, what we found was there were definitely inequities that the area, we, we overlaid where our work orders were with just one layer. We just picked up obesity, obesity rates. So where are our obesity rates? Therefore, where would people benefit from being able to safely walk? Look at those sidewalk um, repairs and they were the exact opposite. Um, where the repairs were taking place had the lowest levels of obesity rates the highest levels were not getting those repairs. And it, so it allowed us to ask, why is that? We did not see that in our street paving. If I overlaid street paving with, say, socioeconomic or um, household income, we found it was pretty well dispersed. And what we learned was our sidewalk repair program is based on um, complaints. Our work orders are generated by people calling in complaints. And the people that are connected to municipality or to the municipal government that feel empowered are the ones that call in those complaints. Right. That's where the repairs were done. The people that aren't getting their sidewalk done, they're like, ah, they're not going to listen to me. I'm not going to bother. Exactly, exactly. And so what we've shifted to or shifting to is a process much like our streets, which is the first determination is based off of kind of scientific assessment. So what are the conditions of our sidewalks? Where are those gaps? Where are those repairs needed? That's where we start. And then we overlay that with those other kind of variables like obesity rates so that we can make certain that it's more equitable. It's been working for our streets. We want to make sure it works for our sidewalks as well. So in a nutshell, what have you found as the top inequities when you look at the 
when you're trying to you know, interwove an equity, what have you found as the most inequitable? Yeah, I think really probably the one that I would say is the most um, impactful, I guess, um, or has the greatest impact is all around health. Um, if you if you look at the disparity, the disparity that stands out the most is life expectancy. Um, we have a couple of areas in our community where one, based just on where they live, could expect to live 14, 15 years less um, length than someone else wow. in, our, in our city. So in the pretty, same city? In the same city. Literally, in some cases, you can see the neighborhood that would have a lower health expectancy than one that would have a higher. Um, there's a lot of different players involved in responding to that, and thankfully a lot of people are responding to that, but that's the one that really stands out. And it's not only about access to health care. That's a piece of it. That's why you're seeing investments by Carilion in moving clinics out into the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. for example. But it's also about, you know, where are those sidewalks? Do they have access to parks, um, lead paint in the homes? You know, how, how is that being dealt with? Um, do they have economic opportunity? It's all of those um, non-health re non -health care related things that we're also looking at. And I think those, those disparities and those inequities are probably the, the ones that stand out the most. And it's interesting here in Roanoke that the two neighborhoods that have the lowest are, are very, very different from one another. The southeast which is predominantly a, um, a white, poor white neighborhood, sure. um, and the Northwest, which is of course um, predominantly our poor right. African American neighborhood. Yeah. So two very different um, kind of demographics, but suffering and, and challenged with the exact same issue. And a lot of it involving economic status? Economic status, in the case of Northwest, I think there's certainly racism plays, has played historically a sure. role in that as well. Um, and both of them seeing the same kind of outcome that folks just don't have as high a quality of life and certainly don't live as long. And, and that really is an inequity that obviously we should be putting um, full attention to. Right. A couple of minutes left. I wanted to talk about uh, a couple of issues. One of them is, um, and as we go to taping, we're not sure what's going to happen uh, with an ordinance, but, you know, getting people, keeping people from sleeping on the streets um, in, in the downtown district, uh, some of the businesses have been complaining. And again, you know, people that are walking through or visiting, if they have to step over someone, it's kind of unpleasant. So, you know, is that an economic issue as well as a humanitarian one? It is, it's both and it's a challenge. Um, you know, we in the city, we have long with our partners here locally as well as regionally, have had a very concentrated effort on helping folks get um, housed that find themselves in a situation where they're homeless. And we've had an over 50% decline since 2012 in homelessness. So what we've been doing is working we're now to the point where we've got folks that are chronically homeless. So they're really battling with mental illness or some kind of substance use disorder. Um, and, and in some of those instances have found themselves sleeping out of, out of doors, camping. Um, and in the last year or so, those numbers have increased fairly dramatically in downtown. So we're trying to strike a balance between continuing to help connect them to services, sure. get them into safe housing, address those root issues that have caused the homelessness, with the reality that it is impacting the folks, that more than 2,000 individuals that live downtown, as well as those trying to conduct their business. Remember, most of our businesses in downtown are locally owned small businesses employing our neighbors, and so it's very important that that um, remain vital um, and economically successful. Um, and we're dealing with real issues, I mean, issues around um, health and safety um, for the individuals that are camping outside, as well as those um, around the area. And, and yes, I, I believe if we are unsuccessful at addressing those issues in downtown, um, it will have an impact on our downtown economy, which itself has an impact for all those reasons we just mentioned earlier on our, on our larger economy. Sure. Well, we've already got a couple minutes left. I almost hate bringing it up, but gun violence is something, and that's, and that's a perception that is also tied to business. People don't want to come to the city. They don't want to move here. Businesses, they hear we're, you know, like Chicago, which is totally not true. But but that's another thing, and it seems like the city's being very proactive. They've hired a couple of people, they've used some grant money. Do you think we're going in the right direction I, there? I think we are, but I still will say we're not having the, uh, the effects or the outcomes that everyone wants at this point, myself included. And you're absolutely right. Um, if we, just as much as we talk about the downtown camping, if we don't get a handle on the, uh, the gun violence, and when I say we, meaning the whole community, you, you can't go long economically when the only thing you see on a Google search is the latest shooting. Right. That will definitely start to impact our economy. And more importantly, it's obviously costing people their lives as well as um, their livelihoods um, as they move through. And so I think we have a very good um, path forward for long-term strategic change to try to keep youth from um, finding themselves in a situation um, that leads to gun violence. Our challenge right now is the shorter term 
really interrupting the immediate violence um, that's taking place. That's proven much more challenging than I think anyone had anticipated, and certainly what everyone is seeing all across the country and struggling with the same issue. And but we've got to we've got to get a handle on that, and it's going to take the entire community. Last question, about a minute left. What attracted you to Roanoke when you first got here and looked around? What 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 attracted you to Roanoke? Yeah, all those things we talked about at the beginning, all of that. I mean, what's really attractive to me about Roanoke is it is that unique blend of a really vibrant urban center. It feels like a much larger city than it than it is um, right up against the mountains. So you've got really the best of both. You can you can go to the symphony or the opera, you can go to the art museum um, on one day and you can be up, you know, mountain biking, hiking, or um, kayaking. I'm, a, I'm an avid hiker, so um, it was pretty easy to, to make a choice that um, this would be a great place to live. We have awesome neighborhoods, um, so it's a, really, it's a really good place that you can live in a great neighborhood as well as get out into the surrounding areas. And it's just, there's something also about the people here that everybody's rooting for success and really pulling in that direction. And that's not that common. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those just kind of checked a lot of boxes that I was thrilled to be able to come here and play a part in that. All right, well, they'll have to put you in a commercial. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> city Manager Bob Cowell, uh, Rolling City Manager Bob Cowell, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I'm Gene Morano. This has been Business Matters. Have a good day. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.